G'day, legends. Welcome to the ISS News, the daily snapshot of news you actually need to see. I'm Anthony Meixner, and with me, as always, is Adrian Sutter. Morning, mate. Um, sorry, we'll just, we just went to where laughing about flannos. Um, they're pretty good news reading jackets, mate. Today, we've got three big stories. Magic mushrooms that treat depression. Interested to hear about this. I'm a big fan of it. Um, we're talking about the Royal Commission announcement from yesterday morning with uh, confirmation of the terms of reference and the panel that's going to lead up the commission. Uh, and then finally, how AI is about to replace our workforce. Interesting. All right. So, so getting straight into the first story, and 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 just to to clarify, everybody, these are studies that are not from um, Karen from Facebook. These are two of the largest medical universities. Uh, in the world. So John Hopkins University, they, they're they doing studies and also Yale University. So we'll put the links in for reference so you can have a look. So this is this is what we've got so far. So a study from Yale University by Alex Kwan, Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience. He says that there's not only a 10% increase in the neural connections after dosing with psilocybin, but they're also 10% larger. So what, what, so what does that mean? We know that the in the prefrontal cortex, this is where a lot of our um, thinking and, and emotional drive is. And uh, we used to talk about lobotomies uh, and people separating the prefrontal cortex from the rest of the brain um, as one way of stopping depression and, and hysteria and, and that. So taking psilocybin is actually shown to increase the neural connections and this has actually reduced depression. Um, it's so extensively studied at the moment that uh, it was granted breakthrough therapy designation for treatment of depression by the US Food and Drug Administration in 2019. So this has kick-started numerous clinical trials uh, and they do have therapeutic effects. There's some other points of reference I'd like to take you to. So John Hopkins University studying into psychedelics. Um, they have stated, and I quote, Two doses of the magic mushroom chemical psilocybin relieve symptoms for people with major depression for at least a month. Second quote, half of study participants no longer considered to be in the throes of major depression one month after psychedelic psilocybin treatment. Both of those quotes are from John Hopkins University. What do you reckon, mate? Um, well, I mean, how much can I talk about? I'm a big fan. I've been, I've been tracking what MAPS has been doing in the States for a fair few years. Um, I'm an advocate for not just psilocybin, but um, treatment pathways. Australia is only just now in 2021. Australian government's just starting to look at this stuff uh, as a legit treatment pathway using MDMA, using psilocybin potentially. Um, they're throwing cannabis on the board as well for, for potential investigation. Um, I mean, I've read a bunch of the stuff that comes out of MAPS. It works or it is working. All of their trials look extremely positive. Why Australia is so far behind the eight ball on this stuff blows me away. Um, why we are not legalizing some of these um, plant-based treatments, um, it, it, it baffles me. I think our political system needs to get with the times, start to legalize weed, start to legalize mushrooms, start to do some proper studies in Australia um, I mean, and, and why not use the veteran community? Like there, there's veterans out there screaming for solutions to post-traumatic stress, to anxiety, to depression. Um, let's get in the game with psychedelic research. I'm a fan. All right, story two for today, mate. Uh, Royal Commission, it's been in the news a fair bit lately. Uh, yesterday, the Governor-General, His Excellency David Hurley, uh, issued letters, letters patent which established the Royal Commission and uh, the terms of reference are now available. We're going to drop the link uh, below this on socials and on and on YouTube, so everybody out there can get their own eyes on the terms of ref uh, terms of reference for the Royal Commission, uh, which we'll go into in a second. Uh, the other news from ABC: uh, its Prime Minister Scott Morrison has confirmed uh, some of the panelists for the Royal Commission. Uh, heading it up is going to be. Uh, the former New South Wales Deputy Police Commissioner, Nick Caldas. Uh, he'll be joined by Supreme Court Justice uh, James Douglas QC and psychiatrist Dr. Peggy, Peggy Brown. Now, I know nothing about these three people, but we are definitely um, putting feelers out to people who are subject matter experts in those three fields, in law, uh, in the policing community, and, and obviously in psychiatry uh, to get some feedback, which we're going to bring you next week. 
Um, just quickly, but I, I wanted to run through a few of the terms of reference points um, that we've seen so far. Now, the terms of the original original terms of reference um, kind of guide came out a few months ago, and then they did hold a bunch of uh, meetings, getting people's feedback, getting feedback from the veteran community. I think they got hundreds of letters in. The final cut for the terms of reference look very similar to what came out at the start. They're, they're, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there I like. I like they're going deep into um, pre-enlistment uh, mental health and, and lifestyle kind of factors. I think that definitely plays a lot to, in, in this space. We've, for so long, we've been looking at, have you joined the military? Did you go overseas? Yes, yes. All right, that's where your problem started. But I think a lot of this shit starts a long way before people join the military, which is something that Sykes... Uh, defence and government need to be looking at. So it sounds like they are. It's still, I mean, everything starts off with we are going to look at a systemic approach or a systemic failures. Um, I mean, that's obviously what they've got to do, but that still leaves it very broad brush. How much time they're going to spend diving into this in the actual Royal Commission, into this pre-enlistment stuff and, and full life cycle um, for defence members will be interesting. Uh, the, the other one that I thought was good was... Um, Bravo for uh, access to services. That's been a massive one for us for so long. Um, it, uh, in the past, they we have built bricks and mortar service offerings in the in the veteran welfare and, and kind of mental health space in garrison towns. Uh, and as we know, most defence recruits come from country Australia or, or away from capital cities. So realistically, once you transition out, all those service services are built in major cities or, or garrison locations. You've got nothing around. So um, access to services needs to be a big one. Obviously, we want everything to go digital. It's 2021. Come on, get with the times. Um, other than that, my only feedback at the moment is it, it still looks fairly broad, but I guess when it's a one-pager and you've got to keep your terms of reference short, they're, they're keeping it broad and hopefully, fingers crossed, they dig into this stuff um, a lot deeper. Now, we will, before I jump over to you, Max, we will um, put the links. There's a link to read the terms of reference. There's also a link to make a submission for the Royal Commission uh, at defenseveteransuicide.royalcommission.gov.au. We'll put the link below this in comments so you can jump on and make your own submissions. Over to you, mate. What do you think? Uh, I like it. They look good to me. I think just reiterating what you said, I think that pre-service history is so important and, and looking at, at childhood and uh, maybe increasing the assessments prior to enlistment. I think that's going to be super important. And then maybe just looking at some of the employment categories these guys are in in reference to the, the, the calibre and the size of um, repetitive blast injury would be interesting for me, mate. Being at DFSW Heavy Weapons and looking at a lot of the Mortimer and, and Heavy Weapons boys getting cooked, um, I think that would be, for me personally, I think would be good. But I like the terms of reference. Um, I'll be interested to see what kind of character these guys are. But coming from Skyma, I reckon he's going to get some pretty pipe, good pipe-hitting dudes in there. So, mate, I'm excited. Yeah, mate, it, it does. It looks it looks fairly positive. I mean, there was a, a good piece in the um, ABC article that say this whole process was disrupted. Like we said on the news the other day, it was disrupted by the changing of the guard in, in the um, DVA minister's kind of seat. Um, and we're hoping now, again, fingers crossed, we're hoping now that he's been briefed, the new minister's briefed him properly and this thing will get back on track fairly quickly. Now, um, the the kind of what we're asking the audience to do on this one, we want to put together next week, uh, instead of the ISS podcast, we're going to put together a roundtable um, of veterans from different parts of the veteran community to spend an hour just breaking down these terms of reference and, and discussing the Royal Commission. Uh, so please, in uh, the comments below, just drop what your thoughts are uh, and and. A, what your thoughts are on this Royal Commission Terms of Reference. B, um, if there's anything you would like to hear brought up on that roundtable panel and, and C, if you want to be on it or if you know someone who should be on that conversation roundtable next week, um, share their name or, or, or tag them in this post and, and we'll get them on uh, the chat next week. Because one thing that we're very conscious of, we don't want to, we, we are at the moment, we, we're voicing our own opinions on this news piece. Um, this needs to be voices from all over the veteran community we can't we can't have one or two people just standing up and saying they're the voice of the entire community we want to hear from everyone and actually get feedback i know a lot of the submissions for terms of reference came from a lot of the older esos um there's there's hundred thousand or so young veterans out there uh that, that need to have their voice heard in this so drop comments share what you think and we'll get you on this round table chat next week to break down terms of reference 
So here's a good story to, to round out the day. Uh, it's not. It's a horrifying story, I think, uh, growing up in the 1980s with Terminator, but here we go. So AI replaces workforce. Uh, that's the headline of the story. Um, Grace, a research associate at University of Oxford's Future and Humanity Institute, and her colleagues have put together a impact project uh, about Machine Intelligence Research Institute. And they surveyed 352 scientists um, and compiled their answers in a prediction about how long it may take for machines to outperform humans uh, in various tasks. Now, some of those tasks they did, they went from as basic as folding laundry, driving a truck, to retail, to writing a New York Times bestseller, um, all the way up to surgery, maths research. Uh, and then to the other end of the spectrum was AI researching and full automation of labor. Now, most of these uh, areas that they looked into, they're within the next 50 years, uh, even all the way up to mass research and surgery, those jobs are obsolete. Now, they've got a big sliding scale of, of about 20 years either side. The interesting point is that um, I'd be is the motive piece. So wh where's the art? When can when can they? So we're doing New York Times bestsellers. That's a bit scary. So all your authors out there, budding young authors, probably don't go to university and learn how to write. Um, but when does art actually become part of that? And and what will AI not be able to be is what I'd be interested in. On your thoughts, Adrian. May I, I I think that timeline, the timeline we're looking at at the bottom, I think you can probably chuck that up so people can see it too. I think that's way too long. I reckon we've got about 20 years and, and all human manual outputs kind of irrelevant. Um, the creativity piece, I, we can already do it. Um, there's already AI out there that, that can um, take music, create its own music, just push those emotional buttons in humans. I mean, I, I look at this and I go, realistically, the human brain is just sophisticated AI. We've got to get to the point soon where we can make one that completely replicates it. So what can't they do um, is the question. I think, realistically, the, the bigger question here is um, machines versus jobs. Going forward, like jobs, every election, politicians go jobs, jobs, jobs. It's like the Western world's election promises is all jobs. How we can go forward with innovating and progressing in the um, AI and kind of robots taking over process while still promising jobs at every election. I don't think that's, you can't, there's, there's got to be a trade-off. Um, all of these, I mean, definitely trucks are going to be um, automated fairly soon. All, all um, factories are going to be automated fairly soon. We probably get, the technology is probably there to do it now. We just don't because it's going to put too many people out of jobs. So I guess the counterbalance, uh, the counter argument is if we do get to the point fairly soon in the next decade or two where robots and machines are taking over all of our jobs, are we going to move to a concept of um, basic kind of the dole for everyone, universal basic income? Um, and that's a whole other can of worms. But that's that's the trade-off. All we need to do now is find a way to give people money without having to go to work, and then we can just let robots do the rest for us. It's a positive, mate. Mate, I'll be interested to see two two sides of this. So one is where is the purpose when you sit on the dole and you don't have a job and, every, and a computer can do everything better than you? What, what do you do? Uh, and the second one is... Um, what's the new election promise when it's not jobs? Is it, I'm going to stop people killing themselves? I'm going to stop suicide. I'm going to improve mental health. Is that the new election promise? And that could be exciting. It would be exciting, mate. And then, then the third one is the way identity politics is kicked off these days. How many decades until robots get their own identity rights and privileges, mate? That'll be an interesting one. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not around for that one, mate. I don't have the patience. Uh, exciting times. Well, guys, that was the news from content that you should be consuming um, tune in next week and we'll give you some more topics. Thanks for listening. See you later.